It is often said that the West civilized the rest of the world. Europe did not civilize the white world. Indeed, before European competitive colonization of our planet, peoples of the wide world had civilizations of their own. Yet, because Europe saw the existence of these civilizations as contrary to its colonial agenda, it defamed them as not civilized. <coughs> it misrepresented them as chattel. And it colonized and continues to neo colonize. We need a, a greater input from academia in understanding the uh, social experience of African persons in this country, and in fact across Europe, and in fact across the world. My thought is that we can equip and hopefully empower young diasporic African persons, particularly in Tottenham, certainly around London, and hopefully across England and uh, across Europe too, with arguments that we have co-produced together, both activists and academics, that really do um, give voice to their concerns um, uh, that were articulated in a way that couldn't be heard back in 2011. Education has arisen as a key uh, site of repair, and I think rightly so. From my perspective, and this uh, is what I uh, tried to put across in the article, the academy, universities, have been a key site of producing Eurocentricity and whiteness. And this is part of the damage that we have to repair. Uh, I'm Jules Holroyd, um, I work at the University of Nottingham. Um, and I do research in political philosophy, and we've been recently looking at um, the arguments, the principles and support of reparations. Um, another strand of my research looks at different forms of discrimination and in particular implicit bias. Um, and I've done quite a lot of work on how we can hold each other to account for um, these kinds of discrimination um, and ways in which that can be effectively done. Um, and then least, very recently I've, I've been thinking about how those two areas of research connect up and how um, one of the things that needs um, repairing and indeed one of the things that could be done as part of repair is this kind of um, addressing the ways in which implicit bias affects all of our um, interactions and also shapes the kind of institutions that we're in. The main reason I'm here is because I work as someone who wants to transform the academy because it's there forever, it's not going to transform itself, and I work with people, primarily black, but anybody who wants to work on issues of liberation, of critical interrogation across. I do a lot of training and workshops, some for academics, some the community I believe in, in, in cooperation. And I see reparations as a means to an end and an end in itself. If we get the money, that's great. But for me, it's about mobilization, mm -hmm. consciousness, consciousness raising, transforming institutions. I was thinking about historical justice for quite a long time. I started my research with the Second World War, especially with the, uh, the Jewish history, uh, their property rights that were uh, looted uh, before the deportations and the assassinations began, and, and, and especially the post-war period, so the restitution, first in the 40s and 50s, and later on, uh, that I was witness, witnessing myself in the 90s, where some of the things were set, settled. Um, and after that, uh, I believe that it is not a good idea to put a fence around the Second World War and say we just talking about reparation, restitution, when it is about the Second World War, the, 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 the history is so much uh, faster than that. A key teaching, a key lesson from our conversation, I think, is that repairing this wrong is about money, but it's about more than money. Reparations has never been presented to me as a solution for anything, because even if we get the money, we'll just be cycling back based on the reality that we're in today. So to have this reparations discourse presented to me um, by Nathaniel from the perspective of reparations is more than um, financial restitution, which of course it is, but you rarely hear that.
the people to my preparations <coughs> about money, how are we going to provide the money, how are we going to do this? And again, coming from the work class background, what I have seen in my, my short brief life is I've seen a lot of people talking about me, basically, working class black bread. So they're talking about me. And, you know, but they're not listening, they're not representing, they're not, they don't come to my state, they're not that. So, to have it, the, the whole conversation kind of we not be launched because obviously for some of you you've been for forever. From my perspective, it's great to be represented and repackaged in a more clearly concise way where you're not simply talking about getting money. I I was intrigued to be here and to, to listen, to learn and to um, to see exactly where this where this is going. I like your statement about um, it's much more than the money. My emphasis would be on more, yeah, rather than the money or much, because I think the more, for me, leads me to potentially say, and what more should we be talking about, mm -hmm. yeah? What's the whole conversation? Mm -hmm. um, law was used as an instrument or a tool. International law was re-rooted from, based on natural law, to positivist law, and positivism was about using law to dominate, colonize, and enslave Africa. So we have to repair international law because international law is still used as an instrument to perpetuate the consequences of enslavement and colonialism. We have to call for the reparation of international law. The distinctive aspect of this uh, event is that we are all equal participants in the creation of knowledge here. And we must respect and esteem each other on that basis. Yes, uh, we have an organization um, called Carrots and uh, the Global um, Justice Forum. Um, we are working on a concept called uh, Mahat Ubuntu Man, uh, which is basically, you know, um, seeing, you know, um, one another as equal. You know, we've had enough of you know people coming from establishment academia into our communities, extracting knowledge, refusing to accredit you know our community and its scholar activists you know with that knowledge and taking it away you know without any accountability and in fact that knowledge whether by them or other people is used against our interests. We are fundamentally about transformation of our communities, of the world in which our communities live, you know, and we cannot be accomplices to any process which hides itself particularly the academic gap, you know, which then, you know, helps to fashion instruments that perpetuate the destruction of our communities. For us, life is a matter of, you know, fighting on an everyday basis to assert our common demand. Right? And we cannot be part of any process that continues to you know, dehumanize, you know, um, destroy, and in fact, carry this process of destruction from one generation you know, to another generation. We cannot be part of that. Without what we have got people working on the financial compensation argument, I think it's important to emphasize that the conversations that we're having here are not happening in a vacuum. There are movements out there, there are organisations, there's a lot of work being done, and so we mustn't see ourselves as an island. Um, so, and that's the importance of bringing together um, co-producers in terms of academics and activists as well. So let's just remember that too. We said at the initial meeting for uh, this project that what we needed to equip young diasporic African persons with is a reparations toolkit. How are we arguing in this toolkit? Um, what, how are we formatting this argument? And how uh, is our toolkit enriching public discourse? What is it adding? There are lots of arguments in favour of repair um, and to repair many different things. But what is the distinctive nature of the argument that we are offering? How should we explain the reparations toolkit? It seems tricky uh, to equip uh, African persons with arguments in favour of reparations because 
there is a sense that arguing for reparations makes one seem like a scrub, or uh, asking for a welfare check, or making uh, playing the race card. Um, part of empowering African people is uh, showing African people how um, arguing for repair doesn't, um, doesn't have to position you in that way. How should we sustain the reparations toolkit? I brought together the people who are here in this room because I want to keep you together. I want to create a network. I want to build relationships. <coughs> Building relationships means that we need to be meeting again in the future. How are we going to meet? Where are we going to meet? In physically, electronically? Funding, we need to fund our meetings. I've obtained funding from UCL for this meeting, but it might be that we want to do bigger and better things that um, that sort of funding can't uh, meet. Where will we find this funding? How should we make these applications? The starting point is slavery or African American. History. And there's, 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 you know, there's no <laughs> Africans in England, there's no Africans in Europe, and that's, that's something that we need to get away from. Yes. And when, you know, in the school curriculum or whatever it is, it's all about the civil rights out there, and we're not talking about Britain. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is I, in terms of identity, because a lot of this um, young people you probably write for were born in this country, so it's not. If they weren't? No, okay. many of them were born from okay. refugees. Okay. Come, come, come but over. a lot of young people we work with are born mm -hmm. in this country. So they are, you know, like, like British. Yeah. But how do you define that? So we started off thinking that they were going to be just talking about history and the legacies of British slave ownership. And then as we went along, we had like the first session where we talked about historiography, who has the power to write history, who gets left out. We asked them what they thought about their own history, what they thought about the national curriculum, what they'd like to see in their own version of the national curriculum, and that really got them going because they had some big ideas about that. Um, and then we asked them at the end, we spoke to them about forms of reparations and what does it mean to them, and the discussion that they had was just mind-blowing. And they, you know, they were talking about institutionalised racism, social mobility. If we're talking about an education programme, I think it'd be really exciting to um, approach these houses um, and to ask them to put in a collaborative proposal to the National Lottery Heritage Fund because actually they're pulling a meeting together next month with BME groups to say they've not spent money on BME groups. <laughs> I'm also going to meet with the, chair, the new head of the CEO of the lot the whole lottery is next this month because they've got a different, they're saying they're going to fund differently for the next five years. But the Heritage Fund has said we are not reaching BME groups, come and talk with us, so my colleague will go and talk with them next month. So there is an opportunity there, okay? And I think if we do it in, in collaboration with the big houses, or the, you know, whoever, National Trust, whoever, then that's, 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 um, the education programmes should, could at least start in those places amongst other spaces that we should commandeer. It seems to me the discussions we've been having, there are sort of two perhaps groups that we're sort of trying to target. One of them is, is particularly school children and particularly, particularly perhaps of, of African of descent. And that it seems to me is empowering African people by giving them access to this knowledge, to this history, giving them, yeah, knowledge is power. So giving them that power through that knowledge. Uh, and the other one, right, en enriching the public discourse to me seems more aligned with the other target group that I've seen, which is kind of decision makers in institutions like heritage industries. The you know the the, the white you know for, for want of a better term, I know the white establishment, which uh, you know so, and sort of try. I mean, of, as as you say, I mean it does feel like the battle against the you know combating the big power structures because ultimately we need to change their minds in order to change the institutional apparatus. I think it's important that we acknowledge those truths because that, because what happens in your signposts, there are people who would normally use the argument, well, my ancestors were enslaved. We could say, yeah, actually they were, by the same way they did that. Go to that website over there, they're doing it, they're linked to the same project, here's the history, and then come back here when you're interested in justice because you're socially connected to that history. I think that makes a much better argument. Mm -hmm. But if what we're doing was then to start concerning itself with trying to unpack the other side, nothing would get done. Though. It's also another reason to, to like emphasise, as you were saying, that, that um, what's being confronted and what's something you need to repair and kind of ongoing structural injustices and 
the failure to acknowledge historical wrongs, like the, the, the forgetting and the obfuscating. Um, because, because the kind of like the sort of oh my this is just going to get just going to get to line it seems to have you know that seems to have more weight. What's being carved up is like a, 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 fun, a pot of money, and people are saying, well, I should get some of that too. Mm-hmm. But it was, if, if we're not talking about kind of material and divisible goods mm-hmm. as, as compensation, we're talking about a, a variety of reparative steps. I mean, they're not they're not finite resources. Sure, there might be the need for <laughs> fixing other di- other dimensions of um, social ills, um, but this, you know, this, acknowledging those historical wrongs is not it's not a finite resource. And it's in terms of what you were saying about the way in which um, there was set laws that people lived by, uh, what is also relevant is the way in which contemporary power uh, bearers seek to justify those injustices and try to make them normal, as in, say, Tony Blair, mm. telling us that he's sorry for slavery, but it was law. Yeah. No, That's if you are a moral person with a sense of what is right, you could never say a thing like that. That immediately tells me something about you and what you stand for. That is, that's, the that's what we teach uh, many law students uh, in their first years. Is, can, is an immoral law, can it be a law? Yes. <laughs> and yes. the answer is always, yes, it is possible, <laughs> but you shouldn't obey it. Uh, absolutely. But then, if the law changes, if, if for example slavery is ended by law, what are you going to do if you if you take yourself seriously as a just Some state, state as a better rule of law, etc., as comment, then you cannot uh, say sure. with open eyes those laws in the past are still valid for that Absolutely. period because you it is contradictory. In fact, the UN values, what are they based on? Who started them? So that's why that we need to it. unpackage these values that are used in the church or in international politics. Well, whose values and what, and maybe we can construct a new set of values. The long and short of it is for, you know, in the, uh, the proposal here is that in the, in the first point, we try to identify the values in all civilizations, as mm-hmm. many civilizations. Mm-hmm. As we can find, particularly the civilizations of the of the peoples of Africa, Asia, the Americans, the indigenous peoples of America, that have proclaimed universal values, mm-hmm. and the European ones as well, mm-hmm. have proclaimed universal values of respect for humanity, respect for the relationship between human beings and the rest of nature, respect for you know Mother Earth itself. These are the principles that you know, were codified into moral behavior, moral values, long before this chapter.